I wanted to speak to you today about uh, a particular form of illness that pervades our societies, uh, not just in the big countries, but also in relatively smaller ones. Uh, this is a picture of the protests that took place in uh, February 2003, almost exactly 12 years ago, uh, on February 15th in particular. My wife and I attended these protests, uh, which were uh, protests against the, Im you know, the imminent invasion of Iraq uh, by the United States and the UK. And I was aware at that time that uh, this was just one link in a whole chain of protests around the world, uh, which was taking place on the same day. And what struck me was the fact that despite the overwhelming uh, opposition to the war, the governments involved were hell-bent on prosecuting it. And it struck me at that time that perhaps we who live in liberal democracies are actually uh, particularly uh, sensitive or uh, open to a kind of addiction, which I call uh, polemomania, uh, from the Greek polemos, which is the word for war, apparently. So the question is, are we really addicted to war? And the more I thought about this, the more I looked at it, I found that there are signs of addiction. And so what does it look like, is the question. Uh, well, it looks pretty normal actually, um, but you can see it. In order to see uh, how it is an addiction, you need to look into some of the details. For instance, here is a, a graph of regional military expenditures from 88 to 2012. And you will notice that uh, the top three uh, lines are, this is the North American expenditure, which is mostly, of course, the US. And um, this is um, Europe. And this is Asia and Oceania, which means all the big countries surrounding um, the Pacific Ocean, I India, China, and uh, Australia. And the remaining three are pretty flat. Uh, the remaining three consist of Europe, I'm sorry, Middle East, um, Africa, and South and Central America. Now, you will notice that in 1989, uh, since 1989, there was a diminution in the military spending around the world, except in Asia and Oceania, which kept on increasing at a very gradual pace. But Europe and America, which were the two main protagonists in the Cold War, their expenditure actually decreased. But in 2001, there's a sharp jump in the level of spending. And it has, in fact, continued uh, despite the fact that uh, there have hardly been, relatively speaking, any major terrorist incidents or terrorist threats after 9-11 in the Western world, apart from, of course, the London bombings and the one in Madrid. Now, the fact is that this global war on terror has continued right down to our day. And it has continued despite the, the financial crisis of 2008, which, in fact, imposed untold hardships on people all around the world. That didn't deter governments from going on spending on war. So this is one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is, if you look at the, the relative spending of the major countries, um, in, including uh, my own, which is India, one of the biggest buyers of weapons from around the world, uh, you will see that the United States spending on uh, military expenditure is slightly less than the spending of the next 14 countries. Um, and these countries, the United States and the next 14 ones, uh, are responsible for the major share of the military spending in the world. So one of the reasons why I thought this might be happening is because of the increasing importance of what President Eisenhower, who um, in his farewell speech uh, after he, um, his presidency was over, he 
gave a speech in which he warned his countrymen and the rest of the world uh, against the development of what he called the military industrial complex. Now, he actually called it the military industrial congressional complex, but he was advised not to uh, include the Congress there. Uh, and in fact, he, his speech turned out to be quite prescient because if you think about it, uh, uh, the military industrial complex has now expanded to become what I've called the militum complex. Militum or militum in Latin means of the soldiers. Uh, and militum is, is actually an acronym that stands for not just military and industrial. Now, where does the industry come in? Well, it comes in through private military contractors in our time, and also through huge companies like Raytheon and Lockheed Martin, which, and Boeing and so on, who have huge multi-billion dollar contracts for the supply of weapons. Uh, then there is the legislative um, part of the government, which is included in this complex. Uh, as they make, as they pass laws which make it easier for the leaderships of many countries to prosecute wars. Um, then there is intelligence. Then there are think tanks which are associated with the, uh, the prosecution of war or which support the prosecution of war. Uh, there is the universities. Uh, now this might be surprising because you'd think that universities are a kind of a liberal bastion of open and free learning and understanding and so on and criticism of, of in, at least in democracies. But it, it might not surprise you to learn that, for instance, the two doctoral students at Stanford University who created Google, which we all use, uh, were financed by the Department of Defense, uh, which also, by the way, uh, created a number of other wonderful things which we also use and benefit from, the internet, for instance. Um, and then the last M uh, is, uh, well, I don't know whether to call it media or mendacity, because the two have become sort of, sort of uh, you know, almost synonymous um, uh, in this particular uh, complex, because the prosecution of war requires that the media support the lies that have to be put about in order to uh, start wars. So, but look at the, the, the cultural side of this addiction. Uh, we often use words like uh, the war against poverty or the war against drugs, but actually they re re really amount to um, war against poor people or war against drug users. And here you have you know, the, the, uh, the movie industry uh, chipping in with their contribution uh, to the prosecution or the, this addiction to war. Uh, so one of the reasons why war is so addictive is because we seem to have convinced ourselves that you know, it's part of the human condition. Human beings go to war. What's so, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's strange about that? So, and so we tend to believe without further examination that war is uh, necessary and uh, it's inevitable. Well, the thing is, is it really necessary? Uh, if you look at historical accounts of wars, you would begin to think, yes, they are. I mean, because this happened, and then this happened, and then, of course, they had to go to war. But the fact is, historical accounts always produce an answer to the question. You know, it's a standard exam question. What were the causes of XX war? Well, of course, if you look at simply the causes of the war, uh, uh, then you have a standard account of the effects that has to be war. But historical accounts typically do not answer the question, how could these wars have been prevented? And this is one of the things that we need to do. We need to look at or reread history to find out which of these accounts or which of these wars could have been avoided. Now, historians agree that World War I could have been avoided. Right? Uh, they are less um, inclined to believe that World War II could have been avoided. And in fact, there are some wars that probably could not have been avoided. For instance, the invasion of uh, East Pakistan by India, uh, which was conducted towards the end of 1971 after India tolerated a huge influx of refugees from 
East Pakistan and kept looking on while the people were being massacred. The same thing happened in Rwanda, by the way. And Rwanda, of course, there was no military intervention to stop the massacres. Right? So that's a good reason why you might think that uh, wars might be necessary. Well, the fact is military interventions might be necessary from time to time. But military interventions do not have to take um, the form of killing. And they certainly do not have to take the form of killing that goes on in, say, that is going on right now in, our, in neighboring countries like Syria and Iraq, and of course in Libya as well, another totally unnecessary war. In fact, all the wars of the 21st century have been wars of choice. Uh, they could have been avoided, but the, pro the, the protagonists decided to go ahead and do it anyway. War is inevitable. Well, the, the argument for inevitability rests on you know, some biological tendency in human beings to go to war. But the fact is, yes, there is a gene for violence. Yes, 40 to 50% of uh, human beings do have genes for violence. But the fact of there being a gene for violence doesn't actually predispose us towards war. War is a diff different category of um, interaction than simply violence uh, in individuals. So uh, I don't believe that war is absolutely um, uh, a complete necessity, nor is it inevitable. In fact, the fact that there are, about, there are a few countries which have given up their military, given up the pursuit of war, makes it uh, difficult to believe that this is inevitable. Now, you might think that, well, you know, what about Switzerland? Well, they haven't had war, but they've been very well prepared for it. Yes, and I think the preparation for war or the preparation to counter any kind of invasion is a necessary part of preventing wars, unfortunately. But the fact of the matter is, wars are avoidable. Um, and the historical record, I think, will, will show you that. So what are some of the consequences of this war addiction called, which I've called polemomania? Well, for one thing, uh, it reduces the citizens of democratic countries to loyal servants of the state. You know, there's kind of echo chamber effect. The government announces that there's going to be a war and everybody else says, yes, yes, well, good. Uh, we'll feel so much more secure. And this security, of course, is uh, bought at a cr quite a high price. Then there are the weakening of mechanisms which have been designed to prevent war. The United, United Nations, for instance, is a mechanism that was created after the Second World War uh, with the idea, never again do we want this kind of thing to happen. And uh, we've had a succession of wars since it was founded because of this addiction. We need to strengthen the mechanisms that we have rather than go around deliberately undermining or weakening them. Uh, the other thing is the indifference to human suffering. Well, uh, there is a tendency, for instance, to uh, minimize the casualties that uh, war inevitably entails. Uh, for instance, when you nowadays wars are prosecuted in such a way that they entail large numbers of civilian casualties. Uh, this is concealed by means of a nice euphemism, collateral damage. Collateral damage gives you the impression that there's some damage happening somewhere which is sort of collateral to the main pursuit of war and we need not concern our little heads about it. Well, the fact is that most of the damage being co caused, for instance, in this undeclared war in Western Pakistan called the, the drone war uh, is, in fact, civilian casualties. Um, so, and, but we don't get to know about it very much because the media don't report it very much and which, again, betrays a kind of indifference to human suffering. Then there's this obsession with national security. Uh, national security is a catch-all phrase which can mean anything that the government wants it to mean. And uh, in India, we had a national security law, or what we call the, the MISA law, the Maintenance of Inter Internal Security Act, under which people could be arrested and uh, put into prison and without any right of habeas corpus or any such, any such thing. No trial. Locked away, thrown away, uh, throw away the key. Uh, and then 
The other thing is that there is a huge industry of lies that, and deception that have to be created to convince people that this is for your own good. Uh, and this, in fact, has a very insidious effect. We don't notice it very much, but the fact is um, the pursuit of truth becomes really endangered, especially when we need to know the truth about how much the government is spending on war, and why is it cutting back on things like public education and health, and why aren't we doing something more about more pressing problems like uh, uh, climate change and environmental destruction. These kinds of problems uh, are become, become minimized when we um, compare them to this larger problem of national security. So I think polyamomania is, in fact, uh, an addiction that is leading to, uh, it's a form of self-destruction. Now that's difficult to understand because we normally tend to think of war as having winners and losers. You know, we win certain wars and we lose certain wars. But from the perspective of the species as a whole, the addiction to war is extremely self-destructive. And anything that can weaken or obstruct this addiction is a step towards peace. Thank you very much.